Hello, and welcome to On Point. I'm Star Harvey, and today we will be discussing food deserts in the South Los Angeles area and their impact on the community. Supermarkets and healthy food choices in South Los Angeles cities are rare commodities, and the number of grocery stores in these areas help determine whether they're classified as food desert or not. In 2013, the USDA formally confirmed Compton as one of Los Angeles County's 21 food deserts, meaning residents have low access to healthy and affordable foods. About 75% of the restaurants in the area are fast food restaurants. The community health councils report that in South LA, each grocery store serves roughly 6,000 people, whereas in high income areas like West LA, each grocery store serves only 3,800 people. Low income is one reason why Compton hasn't been successful in attracting more grocery stores and healthy food options. According to the USDA, some Compton residents live a mile or more from the nearest grocery store. Those residents are then forced to drive miles to the grocery stores in other cities, and many people just have to go without healthy food options. A 2009 study by the American Journal of Preventive Medicine says that communities with better access to supermarkets and limited access to convenience stores tend to have healthier diets and lower levels of obesity. According to the 2011 Los Angeles County Health Survey, Compton, a city of about 100,000 people, consistently has some of the highest rates of diet-related disease in Los Angeles County. About 40% of Compton residents are obese. A third of them have hypertension and 13% have diabetes. On Point's Brianna Burnett has more on the story. Thank you, Star. And today I would like to introduce my guest, Henrik Manassians, Associate Professor of Urban Studies and Planning, and Terry Lissagor, Professor of Nutrition and Dietetics and a registered dietitian. So my first question is, why do we have food deserts? I'll start with you. Uh, historically, we have to go back and look at why uh, certain communities have not been served. And there are elements going back in history with segregation, with covenant housing, and where specifically what businesses were located. And then, so first we have to look at from that perspective. The second factor is that over time as suburbanization started and more and more people with means, uh, they moved out, uh, so did uh, businesses that they followed them, grocery stores being uh, one of them. And the history, you could go back and look at the history of grocery stores that started in 1920s and 30s uh, in New York and then they have come to other parts of the country too and being 10 to 12 top grocery chains or stores at the time. So what has happened is that over time with uh, decline in the industrial economy and more people moving outside of the inner cities and moving into suburbs, there were uh, obviously the grocery stores, they followed them where they went, uh, specifically following the middle class and uh, upper middle class communities rather than uh, remaining in, uh, in, in communities that they were poor. And that along with, and then crime, and uh, along with more segregation, and then drug epidemics that we have had, uh, it has created an environment that businesses, they don't want to go and invest in those communities. And with those vacuums, obviously we have seen that smaller uh, mom and pop shops from outside, such as liquor stores, uh, or and eventually fast food uh, businesses that have moved in and created, uh, trying to fill that vacuum. So in general, that's how uh, desert, uh, food deserts have come about and, and they have remained in uh, parts of the community. And you just mentioned communities, so what communities would you say are specifically in food deserts? Well, in Southern California, when you look at it, the, we had 1992 riots, and one of the biggest issues among the African-American community in South Central Los Angeles and uh, parts of East LA was that uh, there are lack of opportunities for them to buy anything in fresh grocery stores. Uh, and continuously complaints were that there were there are a lot more liquor stores, 
uh, instead of access to fresh food. Uh, if you look at right now, Los Angeles has a moratorium on building any new or permitting any new liquor stores or fast food places in places such as South Central, and that all came about because of the 92 riots. And for the community and community activists coming out and complaining about the issue that they don't have access to jobs, they don't have access to good food places, um, they don't have access to other community uh, amenities that they have to have, and as a result that has led into this frustration that came about with, uh, along with the racial tension and uh, law enforcement at the time in 1992. Okay, so you just mentioned South Central, and Kia Patterson is the owner of this grocery store called Grocery Outlet, and it's an organic grocery store in Compton. So we talked to her about what she's trying to do in her community, and here's On Point Star Harvey with more on the story. Grocery outlet owner Kia Patterson was determined to provide healthy produce to the Compton community, a well-known food desert. So unfortunately right now, um, the residents of Compton don't have that many options to purchase food or good quality food. So at least here at Grocery Outlet, we offer a lot of organics and at very reasonable prices. I don't know where they would go if Grocery Outlet was not here because we have a lot of the other, um, I'm trying to figure out the, the best word to say about some of the other stores that are in the area. They're catered more towards low income and sometimes with that, people assume that you may not want to eat healthy because you don't have the money to afford it. Kia believes the area's low-income household affects the quality of food. You wouldn't necessarily have a Trader Joe's or a Whole Foods or a Sprouts because they consider those stores to be higher end. Now, in the same regard, a lot of the times the quality of produce especially and also meat is not going to be the same because they look at it as um, they don't have the money to pay for it, so we're not going to give them the A quality of produce. They make it a C quality. So what are your guys' comments on that? All right, well, my comment is plain and simple. It is all tied in. Uh, so much of it is tied into socioeconomic status, and, it, and she's absolutely right. And my colleague as well, when you don't have the means to buy the food, then what you'll see is that they are going to put in the, the fast food or the convenience stores and it, do, the, it doesn't encourage healthy, nutrient-dense foods to be provided in those areas. So it's driven by socioeconomics. Do you have anything to add? And yeah, and one, one uh, I completely agree with you. And one factor is also that the fast food industry, the way they design their food is right. mainly engineered. Right. And that engineered food is designed for you to be able to consume it in a rapid amount of time. It's easier to swallow, to chew on it. Uh, if you make food at home and you, it takes hours. If you try to make uh, meat at home, it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of time for you to do that. So it's a combination of factors. You have the food desert in the sense that you don't have access to grocery stores and then at the same time you have fast foods that they are specifically engineered for a large amount of food to be consumed and because it's done in a uh, economies of scale is also much cheaper than fresh food that they're going to purchase from grocery stores. And in addition to that, many of the ingredients used are more addictive. So if you have a little bit then you want more and more and it becomes a habit and the expectation. And then from my perspective as a dietitian, you see the, nutri you see the nutrient density drop. So the populations aren't getting the nutrition that they need. So what do you think will be the future of her store being a grocery, an organic grocery store in such a low income area? Okay, if you want me to take that first, I hope that she makes it. It's going to take a lot of things. It's going to take education. So to educate the community that this is here and we have the foods that you can afford and that will make your children healthy. So if you can package that message to the population so that it's about the children, I think that she'll be more successful in it. And if you can get buy-in from the community, I think then she has a chance. 
Did you have a good day? Yeah, it's, it's not something that, I, this, this, this hasn't happened overnight, okay? So over, over the decades with the fast food uh, uh, franchises moving into communities such as South Central and having liquor stores and et cetera, and changing the trend, the way that people they mm -hmm. eat, it requires, as my colleague says here, uh, 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 some form of educational campaign done by public health officials within the county uh, in order to educate people and push them towards the direction of purchasing and buying more organic foods from a grocery store like that in order to improve the health of the community but also in order to help someone like uh, her to succeed in the business that she has invested in that community. Okay, and so CSUN Urban Studies Professor Craig Altward, who might be your colleague, says Patterson may have a tougher time. The sound has a little static, so let's listen close. Walmart a couple years ago tried these small Walmart marketplaces, um, and a lot of those have gone out of business, and you know, they were trying to do that same sort of thing, where they were almost were more gro small grocery stores, and Walmart is probably your lowest cost producer or provider, and if they can't make it, you know, I, I hope she makes it, and it might be that people just build a loyalty, so there's something about having that small business, that local person, and then with that smaller company, people just have that loyalty to it that you wouldn't necessarily have with a large chain, and maybe that's enough that it over offsets what you have with a large chain. That goes back to the history of the grocery store that my colleague was mentioning before. If you have somebody within your community who is a community member, who cares about the community rather than a corporate entity like the Walmart that he is discussing, you have, in my opinion, more of an opportunity for the community to trust this new business that's made for the community members. And I think that if we don't have hope for this, what do we have hope for? It's true. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, um, again, um, I think that she might be able to make it because if she comes from the community and she invests whatever that they generate in the form of revenue into community services, uh, there will be more buying by the community uh, for them to purchase their produce and their food from that grocery store. And in general, also the demographics in uh, parts of Los Angeles and in South Central has drastically changed around and that could be also play a role as long as that enough of community members are aware of this new grocery store and and for them to have a campaign that they would invite more people to come in and purchase from them with the uh, proper pricing and things they might be able to to be successful. Okay. And so how can we essentially prevent food deserts? Uh, well, food deserts, as my colleague said, spring up. <clears throat> They're sort of related to poverty. And food deserts, when the big businesses, the grocery store chains say it doesn't pay for us to be here, we have to incentivize. We have to incentivize uh, independent grocers or grocery chains to trust that they can make it, that they can provide services, because these are human beings. I think if you touch the heart, that will lead to profit for the big businesses. I, I from my perspective, I think uh, government and most probably some form of public policy that it would incentivize mm -hmm. for some grocery stores to move into communities that they are considered to be a food desert, that would be a one strategy. Uh, unfortunately, we live in an era that, that government and policies are kind of uh, not working towards helping the poor communities. Rather, we leave the, all communities to the forces of the marketplace, letting the market decide. And uh, grocers are not going to go to places that there is poverty. Grocers are going to go where they can generate a lot of revenue, particularly that there is such a fierce competition between different grocery stores. And recently, Amazon purchased Whole Foods, and, um, and we see that there is a war between Kroger, which is Ralph's um, 
I guess, main company and then versus Whole Foods versus others. And uh, so, so I think government has a role very, uh, to play here in the form of uh, incentivizing for some of these businesses to move into poor communities. But we can also appeal to the social conscience of big business and say if this is your strategic plan, then built into that you need to set aside some money that would be going toward helping to develop the health of the, these communities. So part of the strategy for the corporations. So yes, incentivized by government, but also incentivized within each of the businesses. And so Patterson's big thing is making healthier food more affordable. Why do you think healthy food is so expensive? Uh, that's a great question, because they can. It, if you look at the raw ingredients and you look at cost per calorie, the fats like the mayonnaise, the oils, the sugars, all of those inexpensive foods, it pays them. They get more return, they meaning the sellers get more return for their dollar. If you look at the cost for nutrient density, which is the amount of rich nutrition, vitamins and minerals that come within those foods, they cost a lot. So if you look at the cost of apples or dark green lettuce versus a bag of potato chips, it's so inexpensive to produce something that's shelf stable, they can keep around for forever as opposed to the fresh produce. Do you have anything to add? Uh, yes, and part of it is the automated, as my colleague says, industrial production of food. Uh, when you talk about cookies and potato chips, mm -hmm. those are made in a large quantities mm -hmm. uh, in a highly complex automated manufacturing process, while for picking the strawberries or lettuce, you have to use uh, manual labor still. And a lot of people, if you travel through central California, that's what you see. You see a lot of labor working on the land in order to bring something to the store versus a mass production of a potato chips with a supply for the entire country. So, so the cost per unit is, is a lot less to produce um, uh, food that they are not nutritional compared, compared to food that is com uh, nutritional. If we could somehow translate that message of how in inexpensive it is, when we look when we project outward at the impact on health, what it's going to cost us as a society for health care for those children who were raised with not nutrient dense foods, with the fast foods, with the processed foods. As a society, we who have chosen or have the ability to eat healthy foods, we're going to cost society less. So if we could somehow translate that message of let's feed them healthy now and it will pay in rewards for all of society. So how can we motivate people who do live in food deserts to sort of make that drive to further grocery stores who would I have healthier options? Well I think it would be easier to make the grocery stores come to those areas mm -hmm. and what we look at what drives people to make food choices convenience, cost, and education the knowledge. So if we can somehow run programs that educate the local community, what if we put uh, gardens, vegetable gardens, on the elementary school campuses, let the children participate in growing the seeds and picking the fruits and vegetables. You're educating them from the beginning about the importance. And if you put that message of this is really important from the very beginning, then I think the we have to not be immediate gratification society, which we are, invest in the time it takes to educate. Okay, do you have anything? Yeah, and one, one thing I wanna add, it's, it's not a singular issue. I mean, we are talking about food desert because the topic of discussion is food desert, but it, it links to transportation and lack of it and people they don't have access. So. Uh, for them driving or going out of the community. It has, uh, it has to deal with the issue of access to right. open and green space and parks in poor communities which they have less access. Studies after studies, they continuously show that. Uh, along with other environmental hazards, 
a lot of industries are in these communities. Um, in, in, the, in, in, in that interview, opening the, the uh, grocery store in Compton, uh, there is a, a super fun uh, site in, in, in that area in the first place, which is a federally designated uh, hazardous sites. So it's, it's a multiple factors, it's not a singular thing. Uh, however, in order to make some improvement in the community, we have to take first step. And as my colleague said here, starting at schools uh, or, or encouraging the residents to convert their yards and start producing their own or grow their own uh, vegetables, that would be the first step to teach the children and the next generation that they have to also eat healthy. Community gardens, mm -hmm. community gardens, even in the windowsills, if they're shoved into apartment complexes with multiple numbers of people living there, the, it's very inspirational and exciting for children to see the growth and know that they had a part in it. If you think about it, if you think about food insecurity by statistics, we have about 40.6 million people who are experiencing food insecurity. They don't know where their next meal is coming from. That's the statistic that we read about, but actually it's probably more than that. It's probably more in the lines of 44 million people who don't know where their next meal is coming from. So if you look at the local communities and have an opportunity to change that, that's going to have nothing but a good health outcome. Okay. And so, what should consumers be looking for on labels to make sure their food is healthy? Oh, look for the foods that don't have the labels. Those are fruits and vegetables. Mm. That's an <laughs> but first ingredients, they have to understand that on a food label where you list the ingredients, the first ingredient listed is the largest by weight. So if it's sugar or molasses or sodium or any of those things, or a word that ends in O-L, which is a sugar alcohol, if it's got that as the first three ingredients, there's not a lot of nutrition in that food. But teaching to read a food label is very important. First thing is about the serving size mm -hmm. and then looking at the ingredients. Mm -hmm. And so, what are some harmful things in our foods that we also should be on the lookout for? Boy, you just said that. Oh, guy. gosh. <laughs> um, overly processed, high sodium, high fat. But as we get back to plant-based foods in their whole form, those are going to be more nutritious. The more processed it is, the, more, the, the longer it can sh stay on the market shelf, it's probably less healthy, but I do want to put a plug in for frozen vegetables and frozen fruits. Those are picked, harvested, and flash cleaned and flash frozen. So they're less expensive and they're great and they're full of nutrient rich things mm -hmm. that they can have. You can put them in soups, you can put them on pasta, you can put them on rice and you've got the nutrition for very low cost. And many foods, they have corn syrup in them. Oh, yes. And that's, that's also has been a factor right. for impacting particularly poor communities that they right. eat processed food and, and in relations to obesity and other and type and, 2 diabetes and, and other And dental carries. Yes. Yeah. yeah, all of that. You're right. So plant-based foods in their whole form. Okay. So what are some ways people can still stay healthy even if they live in a food desert? Well, I think as we discussed, the first thing is uh, educating yourself. That's right. Educating to know about the portions, about the in ingredients, and then uh, the difference between a fast food versus uh, plant-based foods that my colleague was talking about, purchasing fresh vegetables, fresh fruits. Uh, and uh, first step would be just educate yourself and then uh, organize with the community organize with the community in order to see how can you find solutions to the scarcity of good food in your community, either by community gardens or by maybe carpooling together in order to, you, to do your grocery shopping if someone has a car and sharing with your neighbors and the community. That would be one way of uh, looking at this issue. Another way, and I think it, it helps in many arenas, is looking back at the family meal. We've gotten away from that with a 
grabbing a fast food, grabbing whatever right. it's on the run. If we could bring back the family meal, give us time to reconnect as a family, as a community, I think that would go a long way to addressing a lot of these problems. I'm going to introduce you to a word called companion. Mm -hmm. We know what companion is. Well, if you think of Spanish, con means with, pan means bread. So it's like breaking bread. Companionship and the family meal, I think, would go a long ways. Okay, and so besides eating the right foods, what are some other ways we can also live a healthier lifestyle? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll take this one. Yeah. Balance, variety, moderation, exercise. Okay. So balancing all of the food groups, mm -hmm. having variety of the foods. Moderation means stop feeling guilty if you have a soda or a cookie, and exercise balances it all out, and it makes for a healthier lifestyle and attitude. Do you have anything there? I guess walking for, for <laughs> communities that they don't have right. access maybe to exercise places mm -hmm. such as parks or uh, the ability to use uh, let's say a private gym. One one idea would be walking. Oh, absolutely. All right. So unfortunately, we're all out of time. But I would like to thank you for being here today. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes. So there you are, shuffling through a stack of resumes and you come to mind. This is it, first impression, my way in. But can my resume show you how I truly stand out? Like that I was studying, going to night school while working two jobs just to help my parents pay for groceries. Or being the first one to always step up. No, that's something you just can't put on paper. Look beyond the resume and discover new ways to develop great talent that is dedicated, hardworking, and determined like me. Red shirt, blue shirt, <laughs> yellow shirt, oops. <laughs> yellow pants, red pants, green pants, oops. Thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on social media at CSUN On Point. You can hear us on KCSN 88.5 FM on Sunday mornings at 530. You can watch us on Santa Clarita Valley Television on Sundays at 5 and on LA 36 at 8.30 Friday mornings. For all of us here at On Point, I'm Star Harvey.